It's my pleasure to reintroduce Nathan um, to conclude our morning of speakers on the importance of being motivated. Um, so yes, apologies if you didn't like me the first time, you've got me again. So, um, But we are heading down a completely different track this time. So this isn't so much about sheep and cattle, this is about people. So I think it's really important for us to understand how we operate as humans. When you go to run your business, when you're going to work with staff, family members, all, all those sorts of things, we need to understand how we're wired, how we work. One of the first things that I just want to touch on very briefly is this whole concept of control and influence. So we have in your everyday lives and in everything you do in your business, we have this range of factors. We have things that we can only ever be concerned about but we can't control or influence. We have things that we can influence but we can't control them and we have things that we can have absolute control over. Now the problem is, and if I just pick one example, the problem is we often get caught with things that we can be really concerned about and they steal a lot of energy off us. So what's something that we can only ever be concerned about but we can't actually control or influence? Simple one. Putin. Weather. Putin. <laughs> That's not a bad one. Putin. <laughs> but yes, weather is our classic example. Now it's really easy for me to stand up the front here and say to you, don't worry about the weather. Of course we do. The, the, that, that next rainfall event has such a huge impact on our business, we are always going to be concerned about it. But it can steal our energy. It can steal our focus. So we, if, if we're at least conscious of that fact, then we can influence the way we're reacting to it. In your farm business, you have all of these different factors happening at any one time. Our aim is to try and get as many of those back within it, at our control, or at the very least, our influence. So something that we can't control but we can influence is price. We can influence it by the product that we're producing, the quality of the product that, that we produce, our point of difference with someone else. We can influence the price, but we can't control it. If you look at the rest of the list, though, so much of it we can control. I do have politics up there, so we'll put Putin under that one. We can, we're our aim. So this is no different to any netball or football coach talking about we need to control the things we can control. It's exactly the same in your farm business. And one of the things is to understand in that process how motivation works, how we are hardwired as human beings. What's a good motivator? What motivates people? Money? It's usually the standard answer. Could be. Yep. <laughs> I want to go back to the money one. When we talk about money, most often we talk about profit. Is profit a good motivator? My answer is it depends. It depends who you are. Debt is an exceptionally good motivator. Profit, not so much. So there is a small proportion of the, of the population that are really motivated by money. They just want more of it. They want more profit. More and more profit all the time. But there's a lot of us that are really motivated by debt because we know that we need to make this work. We need to service that debt. We need to be able to pay down that debt. And that keeps us really heavily motivated. The thing that happens though is as you get to that point where that debt gets paid down, where all of a sudden we are into, into the profit zone rather than the debt zone. And we see it all the time. The people just start to relax a bit. We get to hit this level of comfort. Now the best example I can give you is if we were just profit motivated, I wouldn't still be talking to clients about fertiliser. I wouldn't still be talking about the relationship between fertiliser, pasture production, stocking rate and profit. If it was as simple as if you do this you'll make this much more money, my job would be pretty simple. Now, I'll give you another little example. So the, the, the things that we, we actually use, or the things that actually do motivate humans, there's three major factors. The first one is autonomy. That's the ability for you to be the master of your own destiny. Now, we're really lucky in agriculture that we can do that. So much of every day is about doing things the way we want to do it. The next one is mastery. That is being the best you can possibly be. Now, if I go back to our profit example, if I go and sit down with a client and I say, if we do this, this and this, you are going to make $10,000 more profit. They'll go, $10,000 in the scheme of our business, the amount of our turnover. Yeah. If I go to them though and I say, if we do this, this and this, that's going to put you in the top 10% of sheep producers for lamb survival. And they say, yeah, that's what I want to be. I want to be the best. I want, to, I want to be running the best possible operation that I can. The outcome is exactly the same. The profit outcome is exactly the same. The motivation is different. And the third one is purpose. 
And that's being a part of something that's bigger than ourselves. So if we use that lamb survival example, that is this whole idea of being part of the industry. I want Australia to have the best lamb survival that we can possibly get, the best lamb survival in the world. I want us to be leaders in that space. That's part of being something bigger than ourselves. That's not, that as a motivator can be brilliant with all of you. It's not profit that's driving that. It's the, this desire to be the best. So it goes back to one of Chris's points earlier in the day. People say to me, what sort of enterprise should I be running? My answer is this, the one that puts the fire in your belly, the one that you love, the one that makes you want to get out of bed in the morning. And the example I can give you there is if I go and take a really nice little fine wool merino flock and I put it under the control of someone who's spent the last 20 years running self-replacing composites, how well do you reckon they're going to run those merinos? We know they're not going to like them. We know they're going to hate probably almost every point in that production cycle because they're just not, that's not where their love is. They won't do a great job of it. So you do what you love and you do it well and that will give you a bigger impact than, than chasing rainbows, commodity chasing. The thing is change doesn't happen. I talked to you earlier about how we need to implement change and that's why you're here. Change doesn't happen because you ask for it. So if you think about your own staff, your own family, the people that are involved in your business, even some of the external people that are in your team, stock agents, those sort of things. Change doesn't happen because you ask for it, change happens because you inspire it. That's your role as a leader within your business. So just to touch on how motivation actually works. One of the things that happens, you come to a day like this, you'll go out with a great to-do list. Doesn't matter what ends up on that to-do list, but you can end up with a to-do list with a whole lot of stuff written down there that you're going to go home and try and change. Now the reason that we love to-do lists as human beings is because we get to cross things off. We get to cross things off that to-do list. And the reason that that works for us, the reason that our brain responds to that is every time we cross something off that list, you get a hit of dopamine. Dopamine is the neurochemical that makes us feel good. It's involved in love, it's involved in almost every form of addiction. So whether it's gambling, drinking, smoking, every time we do it, we get a hit of dopamine. Every time you cross something off your to-do list, you get a hit of dopamine. It makes us feel good. The reason, and you will know because you will have done this, there are times when we've got our to-do list, you've got a whole lot of jobs on there, and you'll do something else. It doesn't really matter what that something else is. It might be clean the ute. You write it onto the bottom of your to-do list so that you can cross it out. And the reason is you still get that hit of dopamine. You still get that reaction. You still get that feeling. So that's why we do to-do lists. It's why as an industry, or sorry, as a, as a society, social media has been so popular. It's because every time someone sends you a text message, everyone sends you an email, every time someone follows you, likes something on Facebook, you get a hit of dopamine. That's how we get addicted to phones. That's why we check to see, did someone like that post? We get a hit of dopamine every time. So for those of you that are in it, you can find me at Achieve Ag. <laughs> I'll take whatever you're going to give me. Um, but that is why. That's why it works. That's why social media and phones and everything else have become so addictive. The problem with a to-do list like this, as this one's written, is each of those components are too big. They're too all-encompassing. Your brain looks at that and goes, so let's choose the top one, improve lamb survival. It looks at that and says, pretty much, yeah, but how? It's too overwhelming. And we, st we move into this procrastination state where we don't have a clear direction and so we, instead of doing something, we do nothing. The best example of that one is when I was at uni. I have an assignment, you'd think it would be pretty straightforward. I've got a due date, there's an amount of time I can do that assignment and I've got an amount of work to do. Now if I was smart, it would look something like that. What do you reckon it looked like? <laughs> and we fill it in with procrastination. It doesn't really matter what it was other stuff, stuff that we do instead. Procrastination is the whole reason that YouTube exists. There's no real reason for any of this stuff to exist on YouTube, other than for procrastinators. I found that while I was making this presentation. So the problem that we face is this procrastination kicks in because these are too all-encompassing. Our brain doesn't function really well with it. So what can we do? We break it down. 
let's break those first two points down into more manageable tasks. Makes it easier for us to handle, doesn't it? Gets it into small, more manageable tasks. The problem is that list just grew. That list just became enormous. That's only the first two points in that to-do list. And then we get faced with this thing called the paradox of choice. The paradox of choice is one of the best pieces of, of research I've ever seen. It's got nothing to do with sheep or cattle. What they did was they set up two different jam stalls in a park. One of the jam stalls had 24 different varieties of jam. The other one had six. And then they tracked how many people stopped to look at it, how many people stopped to buy. 60% of people stopped to look where there was 24 different varieties of jam. Only 40% of people stopped to look where there was only six. So we didn't get as many people stopping to look at it. But what happens with the buyer decision? Only 3% of people bought jam where there was 24 different options. 30% of people bought jam where there was only six. So they convert that into people and what they actually bought, less than two people per 100 bought jam where there was 24 varieties versus 12 people who bought jam where there was only six. You want to see it in practice, you walk into Aldi. If you walk into Aldi and you say, oh, I'm going to get some biscuits, you walk in there and it's that one or that one. And you stand there and you go, oh, well, I guess I'll have that one. You walk into Woolworths or Coles and there's 27,000 different biscuits in front of you and you stand there and you can't decide, you end up walking down the aisle and you don't, didn't buy any biscuits. That's why Aldi gives you bugger all choice. They're not silly. It's part of their marketing plan. So what can we do? How can we influence this paradox of choice that we get faced with? Our next step generally is to say, well, let's prioritise it. Let's put some priorities against them. Let's work out the A's, the B's and the C's. The problem with that is, when does a C get done? Either never or when it becomes an A. So let's say it's servicing the ute. It wasn't a real high priority until the ute started making that bloody noise. Now it's a priority. It becomes an A, that's when we start doing it. If I take that list that's there, all those things on, on it, and I drop it into a month on a calendar, this is what it looks like. Look at how, just think for a second about how your brain reacts to that compared to the list. There's plenty of spare time in there. There's things laid out pretty well. It's not overwhelming at all. The other advantage we get is we've got a due date on each of them because we know we're all procrastinators. We know we love due dates. We like to leave things until the due date. This gives us a chance to do it. You still get to cross them out. Every time you do it, you still get to cross them out. If you can't cross it out because you didn't do it, it means you have to move it into another date. Give yourself another due date. We still get the hit of dopamine, keeps us accountable, but it also doesn't overwhelm us. Really simple way of just changing the way we think about setting ourselves up. The best way to get something done is to actually begin. Now, when I say begin, that's on a whole range of fronts. This whole thing, you know, I think our, our whole role in the industry needs to change, the way we view ourselves. This is bigger than just you on your farm. The way we motivate staff, the way we motivate people within our family, the way we motivate the rest of the industry. One of our biggest challenges, I think we need to stop being victims as an industry. We need to stop talking about how hard it is. We need to stop talking about how it's so dry, dusty, we work long hours. One of the problems we face is if I go into any school anywhere in the country and I say, draw me a farmer, what do you reckon they're going to draw? It's something like this. It's a straw hat, it's a pitchfork, it's a piece of straw hanging out of their mouth. That's not what a farmer is. That's not what we are. I hear people describe farmers as the salt of the earth. I don't really know what the hell that means, but I suspect it probably means really nice but a bit simple. That's not us either. So part of it is it's our job to change the perception of who we are. One of the things that frustrates me is I hear this. When are you going to thank a farmer? You will have seen these campaigns. Thank a farmer for your next meal. What a load of crap. When are we going to thank an electrician? Or a school teacher? Or a chiropractor? We chose our occupation. They don't need to thank us. We're business people, just the same as everyone else. They don't need to thank us. I think we need to start being leaders and we absolutely need to start listening more. Instead of telling people, we need to listen. The consumer is the king. We need to understand what their perspective is because sometimes perspectives can be different. So quick question for you. What does, a what does your consumer look like? 
Have you got a good idea of who your consumers are? Yep. Some of them look exactly like us. Some of them are completely different. Could a vegetarian be a consumer? One of your consumers? Yep, how? Yep, so if you've got a cropping operation, absolutely. They might wear wool still, because they're only a vegetarian, they're not a vegan. I'm going to do something dangerous, I'm going to show you a photo of a vegetarian. This lady's a vegetarian. Is she a consumer of your products? The one thing I would say is, we can't assume. Absolutely can't assume. We shouldn't discriminate, and the one thing we definitely shouldn't do as an industry is yell. And that is a real risk of social media, is everyone thinks that they're defending our industry. They're not defending our industry, they're yelling at people. And often they're yelling at our consumers, the people we need to buy our product. What we do need to do is listen and find out what is their perspective. Do they buy our product? Why don't they buy our product? The reason I know that she's a vegetarian is because it's my wife. She was a vegetarian the day that I met her. She buys all of the meat in our house. My three kids eat meat, I eat meat, she doesn't. We have a sheep operation, we have run a sheep trading operation, she's a vegetarian. We can't assume, just because we're looking at things from different angles doesn't mean the other person's wrong. We can try and be bullies, we can try and yell at people, we can try and tell people that we think they're wrong. It's actually okay for us to disagree on things. I think the world's gone wrong thinking that everyone needs to agree. They don't need to agree. We don't need to force our, our opinions and ourselves onto other people. Sometimes we need to stop and walk a mile in their shoes. And the risk for us as farmers is we do this. We live in our little bubble and we talk to each other. And we reassure each other. We tell each other that it's okay. It's okay for us to do it that way. We have to be cruel to be kind or we have to do it this way. Because we talk inside our bubble. We don't get outside it. I think as an industry we need to start setting goals and for you as individuals start setting goals. And I like big goals, not little ones. I like you to set big goals and I don't want you to tell anyone about them. Why would I say don't tell anyone? Because someone will tell you you're an idiot. That's not going to work. As if you're going to be able to do that. That's what humans like to do. They don't like to feel like someone else is getting ahead of them. So let's just cut them off at the knees and drag them back down again. Let's just force our opinions onto someone else and, or our, our perspective onto someone else. I want you to set big goals. I want you to set big goals for yourselves. And I don't necessarily want you to tell anyone. Others in your business, absolutely. Outside your business, no. What I don't want you to do is to type them either. When we type a goal, so let's say we're going to put down a smart goal or some smart objectives. When you type them, it uses eight muscle functions. When you write them, it uses 22,000 neurological functions. And the reason that's important for us is that helps us get it into our conscious and subconscious brain. It changes the way our brain works, changes the way we filter. So, now I wish for this one that I didn't change my slide. I used to have a bright green Jeep Wrangler that I used as my example. And if you look out that window, there's a bright green Suzuki Sierra just over there that would have been perfect for you to look at as you drive out. But the concept's the same. I decided I wanted a Ford Ranger. The minute I decide I want a Ford Ranger, what happens? I start seeing them everywhere. Everywhere I go, I start seeing Ford Rangers. I start seeing a Ford Ranger with a tray that I really like. I start seeing a Ford Ranger broken down the side of the road. Whatever it happens to be, I start seeing them. Why do I start seeing them? It's because my brain started filtering it in rather than filtering it out. Up until that moment that I made the, the conscious decision, I want a Ford Ranger, my brain was filtering all of the Ford Rangers out. Didn't need to know about them. It's designed so that we don't go insane. If we have every single sense coming brought into our conscious thinking, we would go insane. So our brain does a whole lot of filtering for us that we don't even know about. So it starts bringing that into me. Another example would be if I was decided I wanted to go to Finland. All of a sudden, I open the paper and here's cheap flights to Finland. And I think, wow, that's amazing. How did that happen? And then you're at a party and you hear someone talking over in the corner, they've got an accent. Next thing you're over there, you're having a conversation with them. Now you know where you're going to go in Finland. And you've probably got somewhere to stay. And you think, oh, it must be fate. It's not fate. It's science. It's your brain. It's the way your brain works. Things don't just happen. You make them happen. So this is our challenge. This is the challenge I put to all of you. 
Real leaders don't need titles. We don't need to wait for someone else to make the changes for us. We need to set the, the targets and the goals for ourselves. We need to stop talking about they. They should do this, they should have done that, they should be doing it this way. I don't know who they are, but they sound like a pack of bastards to me. It's not their industry, it's ours. It's time we all stepped up and took some ownership of it. It's our role as individual leaders. As I said before, whatever we do well today, we can do better tomorrow. Thanks very much.